Okay, hi there, everybody. Um, I am doing this recorded lecture for chapter 22 of our intermediate accounting textbook. And in chapter 22, we're talking about um, accounting changes and error analysis. So um, accounting changes, like we'll talk about, would include like changes in accounting principles, for example, um, uh, different things like that. Um, so we're going to talk about those and then, of course, get practice with these in, in class together. But let me share my PowerPoint slide with you and then um, we will go over these together. Okay, so chapter 22, um, Accounting Changes and Error Analysis. And I'm going to go ahead and start this and grab my little nifty uh, pen out of here. Okay, so some of the learning objectives um, for this chapter, identify types of accounting changes and understand the accounting for changes in accounting principles. Uh, describe the accounting for changes in estimates and changes in the reporting entity. Uh, number three, describe the accounting for correction of errors um, and then learning objective four, analyze the effect of errors. Um, and so we're going to be focusing mainly on um, the first three learning objectives. However, I do like the worksheet that they show us um, in number four, uh, similar to like that 10 column worksheet that we did, um, that we practice a lot in principles of accounting. So it's kind of interesting. But um, anyway, nonetheless, um, Chapter 22 starts on page um, 1266 of your textbook. Okay, so accounting changes. So um, when there are changes, you know, whether it's from uh, changes in accounting uh, principle or changes in accounting estimate, right, it diminishes the comparability of financial information because, for example, if 2000 um, 19, we used FIFO, but then we changed 2020, we use LIFO, right? Then we don't have, we're not comparing apples to apples, right? So it diminishes the comparability of financial information and then also um, obscures useful historical trend data, right? Because then that would make all of our data for um, basically 2020, in this example, all of our data for 2020 would not be comparable um, to the 2019 and prior data, basically. So um, types of accounting changes that we're going to talk about, changes in accounting policy. Um, and that's just like the example that I just used, changing from FIFO to LIFO, or um, changing from straight line depreciation to double declining balance depreciation, um, uh, you know, things like that, right? Um, changes in accounting estimate. Um, so this has to do with any estimates we make, whether it's for um, the useful life of an asset, the salvage value of an asset, um, bad debt or allowance for doubtful accounts, um, our estimate for that. Um, and so some of those different things. And then change in reporting entity. This might be where um, we used to prepare our financial statements in a consolidated uh, format, but now maybe we've sold off part of the business or something. So we're no longer consolidated or reporting um, together, right? It would be reported as two separate entities type thing. Um, and then just like it shows here, we are gonna discuss errors. And in fact, errors are treated similarly to um, changes in accounting practices. However, errors are not considered an accounting change, but rather a correction of an error. Okay, so changes in accounting principle, changeable uh, change from one accepted accounting, accounting policy to another. Examples include changing from average cost to LIFO or changing from the completed contract um, to the percentage of completion method when calc uh, you know, accounting for long-term construction uh, type projects. And just like it shows here, adoption of a new principle in recognition of events that have occurred for the first time or that were previously immaterial is not an accounting change. So 
um, you know, just like it tells us in our book, if we do, if we purchase new inventory, right? If we purchase new inventory and we decided to value the new inventory based on LIFO, even if we had been using average cost in, for, in the past for other inventory, and we decided now to use LIFO for this new inventory, that's okay. That's not considered uh, an accounting principle change or a change in accounting principle, right? Because as long as we're only applying the LIFO basis to the new inventory um, type thing. And then um, three approaches for reporting um, changes. We can um, deal with the changes currently, retrospectively, or prospectively. Um, and so it talks about each one of these um, in your book. And so um, this is page uh, 1269, uh, reporting changes currently. In this approach, companies report the cumulative effect of the change in the current year's income statement as an irregular item. The cumulative effect is the difference in prior year's income between the newly adopted and prior accounting method. Under this approach, the effect of the change on prior year's income appears only in the current year income statement. The company does not change prior year financial statements. Um, retrospective, which is actually what is required by FASB um, as it's showing down here. And so that's kind of what we're going to focus on the most. But um, retrospective application refers to the application of a different accounting principle to recast previously issued financial statements as if the new principle had always been used. In other words, the company goes back and adjusts prior year statements on the basis consistent with the newly adopted principle. The company shows any cumulative effect of the change as an adjustment to beginning retained earnings of the earliest year presented. And then finally, prospectively or a few in the future, it says in this approach, previously reported results remain. As a result, companies do not adjust opening balances to reflect the change in principle. Um, and so, you know, again, we're going to focus mostly, mainly on the retrospective approach because that is what is required um, by FASB. Okay, so retrospective accounting change approach, company reporting the change, number one, adjust its financial statements for each prior period presented to the same basis as the new accounting principle. Adjust the carrying amounts of assets and liabilities as of the beginning of the first year presented, plus the opening balance of retained earnings. So here's an example of that. This one says Denson Company has accounted for its income for a long time for long term construction contracts using the completed contract method. In 2017, the company changed to the percentage of completion method. Management believes this approach provides more provides a more appropriate measure of income earned. For tax purposes, the company uses the completed contract method and plans to continue doing so in the future. Assume a 40% um, enacted tax rate. So, um, you know, it's just showing us uh, uh, again here under the completed contract method, what income before tax would have been for each year what income tax would be 40% um, of that, and then the net amount or net income amount for each year, right? And then they're showing us if we had used the, or if Denson Company had used the percentage of completion method, what income would have been for each year, less the tax, and then the net amount, the net income. And so we're looking at a difference, you know, Basically, you see a difference here, 120 if we use percentage of completion method, 114 if we, we use completed contract, right? Or 108 if we used uh, percentage of completion method, 96 if we use completed contract, 360 if we use percentage of completion method, um, net income 240 using completed contract method, right? Because with percentage of completion method, we can claim revenue um, sooner. And so we see that difference in net income. So for the adjusting entry, again, looking at the difference. So prior to 2016, 
Um, percentage of completion pre-tax income was 600,000. Completed contract income was 400,000. There's a difference of 220 prior to 2016, right? And then in 2016, there was a uh, pre-tax income percentage of completion was 180, completed contract was 160. And so um, we've got a difference of 20,000 there, right? And so income with the percentage of completion method, pre-tax income would have been 780,000. Pre-tax income from completed contract would have been 560,000. So basically we have a difference of 220,000, right? If we take that uh, multiplied by the 40%, that's where we're getting that 88,000, right? So we see the debit to construction um, in progress, the credit to deferred tax liability, and then also the credit to retained earnings. So we're increasing retained earnings by the difference, right? If we take 220,000 times, um, or should I say, um, because the 40%, so the difference in the tax, right? 220 times what? <laughs> One minus 0 0.40 basically is where we're getting. So basically 60%, right? Because the tax rate is 40%. So it's increasing our rate, our retained earnings, uh, sixty percent essentially based on that level of difference of income. All right. So again, retrospective change, right? We have to go back and we have to um, determine what the change would have been in prior years, right? Okay, reporting a change in principle. So major disclosure requirements are as follows. So number one, the nature of the change in accounting principle. Number two, the method of applying the change. Um, a description of the prior period information that has been retrospectively, uh, retrospectively adjusted. Uh, the effect of the change on income from both continuing operations net income or other appropriate captions of changes in net assets or performance indicators other than um, any other affected line item. And the cumulative effect of the change on retained earnings or other components of equity or net assets in the balance sheet as of the beginning of the earliest period presented. So several disclosures um, that have to be made with these. And they show us, um, I guess maybe the first example is, and it might show us this on the next slide, but um, page, um, I'll write this down, page 1273 shows a disclosure from Denson Company. So the example that we were just looking at, um, the change from the completed contract method to the percentage of completion method. Um, so, okay. All right, so the adjustments to retained earnings. So if retained earnings had a beginning balance of 1,360,000 at the beginning of 2015, again, before the change, um, we see here is our beginning balance. Uh, we added net income. And so we had uh, 1.6 million. That's what flowed to the beginning of the next year. And then we added net income, 1696. That's what flowed to the beginning of the next year. And then we added net income, right? And so we are at 1.81 million, right? 1,810,000, right? So now we want to go back and we want to look at the cumulative effect or the overall difference. And let me go back here um, real quick and see where. Um, here it is right here, that cumulative effect, right? And so we see that cumulative effect, um, percentage of completion um, with the percentage of completion method, retained earnings would have been 1.72 million. With completed contract, they were 1.6. So that's a difference of 120,000. 
All right, and then so this just shows us how this would pre be presented on the retained earnings statement. And so we see that here, um, you know, looking at the change um, here, it says add the adjustment for cumulative effect on prior years of applying retrospectively the new method of accounting for construction contracts. So we're just adding basically that uh, $120,000 increase in net income. We're adding that to retained earnings. Okay. All right, so uh, change in principle, um, you know, again, this is a different example, um, you know, with the percentage of completion, completed contract, it says, Pam Erickson Construction Company changed from the completed contract to the percentage of completion method of accounting for long-term construction contracts during 2018. For tax purposes, the company employs the completed contract method and will continue this approach in the future. Hint, adjust all tax consequences through the deferred tax liability account. Okay, so we're looking at um, pre-tax income with the percentage of completion method would have been 780,000 in 2017, 700,000 in 2018, right? And so remember, they're changing from the completed contract method. So this is the old, this is the new right, from the completed contract to percentage of completion. Okay, so under the completed contract method in 17, they only claim 590,000 in pre-tax income. In 2018, they claimed 480,000 in pre-tax income. So now we've got a difference in 2017 of 190,000, a difference in 2018, um, 220,000, right? Okay. All right, so assume a tax rate of 35%, what entries are necessary to adjust the accounting records for the change in accounting principle? What is the amount of net income and retained earnings that would be reported in 2018? Assume beginning retained earnings for 2017 to be 100,000. All right. And so we see here that first um, entry. So, okay, so we've got a difference of 190,000. They already had that calculated for us, you know, times the 35% tax. And so that equals the 66,500. So the net of tax, 123,500, right? And then we made the change in 2018. So when we do this entry, um, it's just to record the previous year, right? It's just to adjust the previous year because we made the change, we decided to make the change in 2018. So for 2018, we're automatically gonna do it the new way, right? But 2017 um, is what we need to go back and adjust. And so they're showing us that if we had a difference of 190,000 debit construction and progr uh, progress, and then that 190,000 times 35% is that deferred tax liability. Um, and then the credit to retained earnings for 123,500. Right, because we're creating an additional tax liability by doing this adjusting entry, right? By doing this um, entry for the change in accounting principle. We are increasing our um, pre-tax income basically, right? We're increasing our pre-tax income, right? That's what this is. Remember, this is pre-tax income. And we could all, we could even say, you know, it's the difference between these two. We could be a little bit more specific. Difference in the pre-tax income from percentage of completion to complete a contract. So we're increasing our pre-tax income. So now we owe 35% of that deferred tax liability. 
and then again, the difference between those two, our retained earnings, is what we would have increased in in um, in retained earnings. So from two thousand, this would have been like two thousand seventeen. Um, the difference two thousand seventeen net income, right? Our net income in two thousand seventeen should have been one hundred and twenty three thousand five hundred higher if we would have used the percentage of completion method. So we're adjusting that. Okay, looking at the comparative statements, um, we can see here again on the income statement and the statement of retained earnings. So we, we show the previous uh, 2017, that was based on the um, completion method uh, or uh, contract method rather. And then now we show the restatement and then our 2018 numbers, right? So we only had to adjust 2017 because again, we made the accounting change. We, ch we changed the accounting principle in 2018. So our 2018 stuff was already going to be prepared according to the new principle. We had to restate 2017. All right, so again, income tax would have been, based on our previous information, 206,500. Um, because we increased our pre-tax income, we also increased our income tax percentage. Um, and then again, you see the increase from 383,500 to 507,000 in net income. So instead of, because we're adding this extra um, into net income, we see that our statement of retained earnings is also higher as well. And so based on the old stuff, um, we would have had, what, retained earnings of 483,500. But again, now with our new numbers, right, we've got net income of 500, uh, 507,000. So if we've got beginning balance and retained earnings plus our net income, now that gets us up to 607,000 after the change in accounting principle. And then we see here on this last year, 2018, and the, the year in which the change was made, we start with old principal retained earnings, right? We start with the old principal retained earnings. We add that accounting change. Remember, that's that net income or the net effect of in, you know changing to percentage of completion method. Um, that gives us beginning balance of 607,000 that we calculated down here. And then we're adding our net income 455. So ending retained earnings 1,062,000. Okay, direct versus indirect effects of the changes. So um, direct effects, FASB takes the position that companies should retrospectively apply the direct effects of a change in the accounting principle. Indirect effect is any change to current or future cash flows of a company that result from making a change in accounting principle that is applied retrospectively. So let me find, okay, so it talks about this on page 1279. Um, and um, so direct effects, an example of a direct effect is an adjustment to an inventory balance as a result of a change in the inventory valuation method. Um, another inventory related example would be an impairment adjustment resulting from applying the lower of cost or net realizable value or the lower of cost or market test to the adjusted inventory balance. Um, Related changes such as deferred income tax effects of the impairment adjustment are also considered direct effects. Um, and then indirect effects. So uh, example of an indirect effect is a change in profit sharing or royalty payment that is based on reported amounts such as revenue or net income. 
indirect effects do not change prior period amounts. So they're saying um, a profit sharing or a, or a royalty payment on this one, right? Profit sharing or royalty payment because profit sharing or royalty uh, payments are usually based on net income. So if we go back and we make a change to net income, that's gonna indirectly affect these two different things, right? A change to net income is, is gonna directly affect retained earnings, as we saw, right? It's gonna directly affect um, the tax um, obligation, right? Those are things that it's gonna directly affect, um, but indirectly also, like they say in the book, profit share and royalty payments. <clears throat> Okay, your book also talks about impracticability. Um, and, and basically, this is just if it's, if it's impractical, impractical <laughs> and it doesn't make much sense to go back and retrospectively adjust it, um, then we do not necessarily have to, if any of these conditions exist. And so it says companies should not use retrospective application if one of the following conditions exists. So Company cannot determine the effects of the retrospective application. Retrospective application requires assumptions about management's intent in a prior period. Retrospective application requires significant estimates that the company cannot develop. So just like it shows here, if any of the above conditions exist, the company prospectively applies the new accounting principle. So prospectively meaning just future periods. Moving forward, perspectively, right, uh, applies the new accounting principle. Um, okay, good. Okay, perspective reporting. So changes in accounting estimates. And, and so, yeah, so we've been looking at changes in accounting principles. Um, and so now it's going to look at some examples of changing in accounting, changes in accounting estimates. And so uh, with changes in accounting estimates, um, we prospectively report these or moving forward report these. So changes in accounting estimates are reported prospectively, uh, account for changes in estimates in number one, the period of the change, if the change affects that period only or the period of the change and future periods if the change affects both. Uh, FASB views changes in estimates as normal recurring corrections and adjustments and prohibits retrospective treatment. So, you know, some of these estimates, again, we've talked about um, before. So, um, uncollectible receivables, basically our bad debt expense, our allowance for doubtful accounts, inventory obsolescence, um, Estimates in useful life and salvage value of assets. Estimates about the periods benefited by deferred cost. Um, warranty estimates or, or liability estimates for warranty cost and income taxes. Recoverable mineral reserves, change in depreciation methods, right? Those are all examples of estimate changes. So here's our example of that. It says Arcadia High School purchased equipment for 510,000, which was estimated to have a useful life of 10 years with a salvage value of 10,000 at the end of that time. Depreciation had been recorded for seven years on the straight line basis. In 2017, year eight, it is determined that the total estimated life should be 15 years with a salvage value of 5,000 at the end of that time. So what is the journal entry to correct prior year's depreciation, which again, it's a prospective adjustment. So there's no entry for prior periods or years, right? And then we would just make the change in 2017. Oh, they wrote that there. <laughs> I forgot that that little red thing popped up. Okay, that's all right. No entry required, right, for, for this one, because we don't, it's not, it's not retrospective. It doesn't go back and change, you know, last year's or the prior year's data, right? 
it's prospective. So just moving forward, essentially. So um, this one showing, okay, so we had an equipment cost of 510,000. We had a salvage value of 10,000. So our depreciable cost was 500,000. We divided that by the original useful life of 10 years. So we were depreciating 50,000 per year times seven years. We've depreciated 350,000, okay? So we take original cost of the asset and now minus the um, new salvage value, the new salvage values uh, 50 or uh, 5,000, then that takes us to 505. And then we subtract out what we've already depreciated. Um, and so what is that? The 150, 155 is what we, have left to depreciate. Um, I, I know it's showing net book value here of 160. And maybe it would have made more sense for me to say minus, because um, we're going to take that 160. Oh, come on now. We're going to take that 160 and we're going to minus the $5,000, the new salvage value. So then we're going to depreciate 155,000. I know I got to my number a little bit different way, but we're going to depreciate 155,000. The original life of the asset was 10 years. I forget what they said. Um, total estimated life should be 15 years. So we're extending the life of the asset too. So it was originally 10 years. We had already depreciated seven of those. So we had three years left. And now we're saying it should be 15. So basically we're gonna take this divided by eight years, right? Because we had three years left, plus we've extended the life five years. So we still have got eight years to depreciate this thing. So it's showing there um, the 155,000, the depre new depreciable cost divided by the new useful life Right, so this is this was new. This estimate change. This was new. This estimate change. So now we're going to depreciate moving forward nineteen thousand three hundred and seventy-five per year. So that one's not too bad. Um, changes in accounting estimates are a lot easier to deal with than changes in accounting principles. But anyway, we're going to get practice, you know, with both of them. So. Okay, so disclosures company need not disclose changes in accounting estimates uh, made as part of normal operations such as bad debt allowances or inventory obsolescence unless such changes are material. However, for a change in estimate that affects several periods, such a change in the service life, such as a change in the service lives of depreciable assets, Company should disclose the effect on income from continuing operations and relate it per share amounts of the current period. And they show us an example of this um, page 1282. They show us an example of this disclosure um, for Ampco Pittsburgh Corporation. <laughs> All right, changes in reporting entity. Examples of a change in reporting entity are um, presenting consolidated statements in place of statements of individual companies. Um, so whichever way we go, if we're doing consolidated now and we switch to individual statements, that's a change in reporting entity. Or if we're going the other way, if we go from, you know, individual financial statements to now we're consolidating them. That's a change in reporting entity, right? Changing specific subsidiaries that constitute the group of companies for which the entity presents consolidated financial statements. Um, so, you know, different subsidiaries or sister companies, if you will, um, you know, moving in and out of the 
of the group or, or changing that collection of companies um, that make up our consolidated financial statements. Um, changing the companies included in the combined financial statements or uh, changing the cost equity or consolidation method of accounting for subsidiaries and investments. So, um, you know, changing from, you know, for example, if we're using the equity method, uh, changing, um, you know, the, me the method of reporting or whatever, right? And it says reported by changing the financial statements of all prior periods presented. Right, change in reporting entity reported by changing the financial statements of all prior periods presented. Okay, so then accounting errors. So types of accounting errors, um, and these are just to name a few. It actually shows us um, some common errors. It talks about some of these um, bottom of page twelve eighty four um, into twelve eighty five. So. Number one, a change from an accounting principle that is not generally accepted to accounting policy that is acceptable. Uh, number two, mathematical mistakes. Um, errors can certainly result from ma mathematical mistakes. Number three, changes in estimates that occur because the company did not prepare the estimates in good faith. Uh, number four, failure to accrue or defer certain expenses or revenues. Number five, misuse of facts, or number six, incorrect classification of a cost as an expense instead of an asset and vice versa. And so here um, is the example of what it shows us on page um, 1285. So um, accounting errors and how, would, how we would restate them. So expense recognition um, error, recording expenses in the incorrect period for an incorrect amount, uh, revenue recognition error, instances in which revenue was improperly recognized, questionable revenues were recognized, or any other number of related errors that led to misreported revenue. Misclassification includes restatements due to misclassification of short or long-term accounts or those that impact cash flows from operations. Um, equity errors, improper accounting for earnings per share, restricted stock, warrants, and other equity instruments. Um, allowances and contingency errors, errors involving accounts receivables, bad debt, inventory reserves, income tax, allowances, and loss contingencies. And then finally, errors in long-lived assets, asset impairments of property, plant, and equipment, goodwill, or other related items. And then here are a few more again that your book shows us tax errors, errors involving correction of tax provision, improper treatment of tax liabilities and other tax related items. Equity or other comprehensive income, improper accounting for comprehensive income equity transactions, including foreign currency items, minimum pension liability adjustments, um, unrealized gains and losses on certain investments in debt, equity securities and derivatives. Um, inventory errors, inventory costing, valuations, quantity issues, and cost of sales adjustments. Um, equity stock options, improper accounting for employee stock options or other. Any restatement not covered by the listed categories. All right, so accounting um, for errors. So all errors must be corrected. Um, record correction of errors from prior periods as an adjustment to the beginning balance of retained earnings in that current period. Such corrections are called prior period adjustments. For comparative statements, a company should restate the prior statements affected to correct for the error. So here's our example of that. It says in 2018, the bookkeeper for Selectro Company discovered an error. In 2017, the company failed to record 20,000 of depreciation expense on a newly constructed building. Okay, so let's think about this. If we did not record this, failed to record this, what would it do? That means that net income would be overstated, right? Net income would be overstated. 
because if we would have subtracted that depreciation expense, that would have lowered net income. So net income would be overstated in this case, which then means retained earnings would also be overstated, right? Because um, you know, if we would have recorded this depreciation expense, that would have reduced our net income, that would have reduced how much we transferred to retained earnings. Um, so both of those net income and retained earnings would both be overstated, right? This building is the only depreciable asset Selectro owns. The company correctly included the depreciation expense in its tax return and correctly reported its income taxes payable. So with the error, we had income before depreciation of 100,000. We forgot to claim depreciation, so zero. So that gave us income before taxes of 100,000. Uh, again, we're assuming a tax rate in this case. Um, I guess it doesn't technically tell us that. But then we would have um, income tax expense, 40,000, which would give us net income of 60,000, right, with the error. Without the error, we would have reduced, right? We still started with that 100,000 income before depreciation expense, but then we subtract 20,000. So now we got income before income tax of 80,000. And so we're taking that 80,000. I, I think it's 40%. I think if we take this 80,000 times 40%, that's the 32,000, right? That takes us down to a $32,000 tax expense and a $48,000 net income. So what are the entry that Selectro should have made and did make for recording depreciation expense and income taxes? And so we see here without the error, there was no entry made for depreciation. The entry that the company did make was the debit to income tax expense, credit to deferred tax liability, credit to income taxes payable, right? That's what they made. But this is what they should have made, right? These are the entries they should have made. We should have debited depreciation expense for 20,000, credited accumulated depreciation for 20,000, right? And then instead of having this deferred tax liability, because we claimed a different amount of depreciation on our taxes, we should have just debited income tax expense, credited income tax payable. All right. Um, and, and so it's just showing us here the effects on the income statement. I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, depreciation expense, because we did not charge depreciation expense that was understated. Right, so that's why we had to do a debit to depreciation expense to record the correct amount. Income tax expense, we were, we were recording more income tax expense than what we should have. So income tax expense was overstated. And then of course, net income, like we already said, was overstated. Uh, balance sheet effects, if we didn't record this, uh, accumulated depreciation then would have been understated and deferred tax liability would have been overstated. Okay. All right, so prepare the proper correcting entry in 2018 that should be made um, by Selectro. And so I know this thing is kind of funky looking the way all of these come up, but um, retained earnings. So Thinking about retained earnings, right? We had um, essentially a difference here. Um, and what's the best way to look at this? So, um, I'm confusing myself here with the different uh, line items here. So um, we had the difference in depreciation expense. We had the decrease in income tax expense, right? Because income tax expense decreased um, from 40,000 down to 
32, right? And basically we got to do the opposite to the deferred tax liability. We got to get that off of our books. Um, it, okay, so income tax expense was um, 40, right? And we want to reduce that down, right? So it was 40. We need to reduce that down to 32. So that's where we're getting uh, essentially, um, you know, the difference between those two. So that's an $8,000 difference, right? Right, because we're reducing that down. And then that, um, that would be like an in like a debit because, let's see, let me think about this. That would be a credit to the expense, right? And then the difference between these two, so 20,000 versus the 8,000, that $12,000 difference is the debit to retained earnings. De debit to deferred tax liability. And then again, we see here the credit to uh, accumulated depreciation. Okay, for single period statements, it's a lot easier. We just have to make the adjustment on a single statement. So this one shows uh, Selectro Company has beginning retained earnings balance at January 1, 2018 of 350,000. The company reports net income of 400,000 in 2018. So um, basically we would make this adjustment first, right? And so you see here the correction of the error is the depreciation less the applicable tax reduction. That's where that 12,000 on the previous slide was coming from. So if we had 350 minus 12,000, that would have taken us down to 338. And then we're adding net income. So we've got retained earnings ending balance, 738,000. For comparative statements or statements that cover multiple years, Companies should make adjustments to correct the amounts for all affected accounts reported in the statements for all periods reported. Restate the data to the correct basis for each year presented. Show any catch-up adjustment as a prior period adjustment to retained earnings for the earliest period it reported. So here's an example. It says, before issuing the report for the year into December 31, 2017, you discover a $62,500 error that caused 2016 inventory to be overstated. Um, overstated inventory caused cost of goods sold to be lower and thus net income to be higher in 2016. Would this discovery have any impact on the reporting of the statement of retained earnings for 2017? Assume a 20% tax rate. So yes, it would have some impact, right? Because we have to um, we have to go back and record it as a prior period adjustment, and so we see that here on the next slide. So net of tax, remember it was um, sixty two thousand five hundred, but a twenty percent tax rate. So let me write this down here, right? So 62,500 times one minus 0 0.20. In other words, times 80%, right? That's the prior period adjustment net of tax. And so we're decreasing retained earnings. We see here decreasing retained earnings down to 1 million. And then we add net income for the period. Um, we subtract dividends for the period and that gets us to that ending balance in retained earnings, 1,060,000. Okay, so here are some, uh, or a summary of the different accounting changes and correction of errors that they've talked about. So I'm gonna see if I could blow this up a little bit here. So changes in accounting principle. 
employ the retrospective oh man when i'm blowing it up it does not let me write on it okay employ the retrospective approach by letter a changing the financial statements of all prior periods presented um, usually three years right when companies pre present their cons um, comparative financial statements it's usually three years um, so changing the financial statements of all prior periods presented, disclosing in the year of the change the effect on net income and earnings per share for all periods presented. Letter C, reporting an adjustment to the beginning retained earnings balance in the retained earnings statement in the earliest years presented, earliest year presented. If impractical to determine the prior period effect, do not Right, so if if it's not practic practical, <laughs> impracticable, impracticable, um, do not change prior year's income. Use opening inventory in the year the method is adopted as the base year inventory for all subsequent LIFO computations. Disclose the effect of the change on the current year and the reasons for omitting the computation of the cumulative effect and the pro forma amounts of prior years. And then here's um, the other part of that, um, changes in accounting estimates. So um, employ the current and prospective approach by letter A, reporting current and future financial statements on the new basis. Letter B, presenting prior period financial statements as previously reported. Letter C, making no adjustments to current period opening, ba opening balances for the effects in prior periods. Uh, changes in reporting entity employ the retrospective approach by A, restating the financial statements of all prior periods presented. Letter B, disclosing in the year of the change the effect on net income and earnings per share data for all prior periods presented. And then changes due to error, employ the restatement approach by one, correcting all prior period statements presented. Number two, or letter B, restating the beginning balance of retained earnings for the first period presented when the error effects occur in a period prior to the first period presented. Okay, error analysis. Companies must answer three questions. What type of error is involved? What entries are needed to correct the error after discovery of the error? How are the financial statements to be restated? So companies treat errors, as we said, as prior period adjustments and report them in the current year as adjustments to the beginning balance of retained earnings. So we can have balance sheet errors, we can have income statement errors. Um, balance sheet errors affect only the presentation of an asset liability or stockholders equity account. Um, if it's a current year error, we reclassify item to its proper position. If it's a prior year error, we, we restate the balance sheet of the prior year for comparative purposes. I'm just trying to find here where exactly. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, because they talked about this in the um, book. Okay. So examples of balance sheet errors, the classification of short-term receivables as part of the investment section, the classification of notes payable as an account payable, or the classification of plant assets as inventory would all be examples of balance sheet errors. Income statement errors, improper classification of revenues or expenses. Um, if it's a current year error, we reclassify the item to its proper position. If it's a prior year error, we, re we restate the income statement of the prior year for comparative purposes. Um, income statement errors, uh, just like it said, involve improper classification. Examples include recording interest revenue as part of sales revenue or uh, recording purchases as bad debt expense or recording depreciation expense as interest expense, right, for, for example. 
Okay, balance sheet and income statement errors. So counter balancing versus non counter balancing. So counter balancing errors are errors that'll be offset or corrected in the next period. Um, so like in the book, they give us the example of, you know, the accountant makes an error because she or he whatever forgets to record accrued wages. So accrued wages, you know, would be like a debit to salary expense, a credit to salaries payable type deal, right? Accrued wages. But as soon as the next pay period in the, you know, especially if it's like around the last day of the year, right? Say December 31st, as soon as it's the next pay period in January, that error will, will correct itself basically, right? So counterbalancing errors um, are offset or correct themselves over two separate periods. So it, it just like it shows here, um, and I was trying to show, so it mainly talks about these bottom of page 1291, top of page um, 1292. And it, it shows us a few examples, uh, failure to record accrued wages, failure to record prepaid expenses, um, understatement of unearned revenues, overstatement of accrued revenue um, are, are some of the counterbalancing errors that they talk about, right? So if the company has already closed the books, if the error is already counterbalanced, no entry is necessary. So if we've already closed our books, for example, for 2020, and now we're into 2021 and the error has already corrected itself, no entry is necessary. If the error is not yet counterbalanced, make adjusting entry to adjust the present balance of retained earnings. Uh, number two, if a company has not closed the books, um, if error already count counterbalanced, make entry to correct the error in the current period and to adjust the beginning balance of retained earnings. If error not yet counterbalanced, make entry to adjust the beginning balance of retained earnings. So um, just like it shows here, for comparative purposes, restatement is necessary even if a correcting journal entry is not required. All right, non-counterbalancing errors, non-counterbalancing non -counter -counter errors are errors that do not offset themselves in the next accounting period. They do not correct themselves in the next accounting period. So companies must make correcting entries even if the books have already been closed. Um, some non-counterbalancing errors, failure to record depreciation, failure to adjust for bad debts um, are a couple that they talk about in the book. Um, and then they show us this worksheet. And again, when we're in class, we're gonna talk about this more because I actually think it's pretty cool looking. Um, looks very similar to like the 10 column worksheet that we practice back in principles of accounting, but using the worksheet um, to correct some of these errors, I think makes it helpful in kind of seeing which accounts need to be adjusted. Um, but that worksheet um, 1295, page 1295 worksheet. Anyway, we're gonna um, talk about that in class together because it is a really good tool. Okay, hopefully that was helpful um, in understanding chapter 21, um, or excuse me, chapter 22. Oh, I'm losing my mind. Um, uh, of course, we will go over these in class together. Um, so just as always, once you guys have a chance to view this recorded lecture or read the chapter, um, by all means, feel free to email me or see me in class and I will see you guys soon. Bye bye.